Good morning to everyone. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, uh, my name is Lanya Saperstein. I'm a partner at Jones Day and a longtime friend of the CGCC. I'll be your moderator today. Let me start with a, um, uh, an introduction and tell you what we plan to cover today in broad terms. Uh, the webinar originally was intended to be focused on the Department of Defense's uh, recently updated Communist Chinese Military Companies list. Um, or, uh, but when we started pulling the webinar together um, and getting polling questions from the members, it seemed like there was some um, uh, questions about a broader range of issues covering um, sanctions. Um, and so uh, we decided to, amongst us, to expand it um, more broadly. So the plan today is to give uh, a overview of the relevant laws, regulations, executive orders that make up the US sanction and export control programs. And then we will focus more specifically on um, the recent actions, and there's been a number of them, uh, impacting Chinese companies. Uh, and then finally, uh, we hope to provide some guidance on best practices um, in response to what seems like daily developments. Um, um, now, having done a number of these webinars, I know and I recognize it's hard to sometimes achieve the right balance between giving too much of an overview or getting too much or giving too much detail. Uh, I hope we strike the right balance today, but uh, if you have any questions, um, we haven't uh, answered something, we're going too broad, we're going too narrow, uh, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function uh, to ask us questions and we will do, uh, we'll either address them in real time or address them at the end, but we'll do our best to address all the questions that are sent to us. Now, sanctions um, address who you can do business with, export controls deal with what you can send outside the US. We will not really be covering in much detail the third part of the giant web, which is investment into the US. It's obviously been a lot of coverage about WeChat, TikTok, um, and while we'll certainly talk about it, uh, particularly in the context of does it make sense to lobby, um, uh, that's not going to be the focus. Um, that is going to be a subject for another day, uh, another webinar on CFIUS and inbound uh, deals. But again, if you have a question um, about CFIUS or inbound uh, type investments, feel free to ask us uh, via the Q&A function. Um, before turning to uh, our impressive panelists, two preliminaries. Um, thank you. Um, the first is um, uh, the, uh, the webinar is being recorded um, and PowerPoint slides uh, and our contact information will be uh, made available after the event. Um, second, uh, we have the necessary disclaimer. Uh, the opinions expressed today, including by me and the other panelists, are our own and do not necessarily reflect the views of our respective firm. So uh, turning to the panel, uh, we have a terrific panel. Uh, having worked with them to prepare for the webinar today, um, they're not only smart, um, but they're also very gracious. So it's been a pleasure to work with them. Uh, first up, uh, John E. Smith is a former director at, the, uh, at OFAC, so he certainly knows his stuff, and he is now a partner uh, and co-chair of MOFO's national security practice. Uh, next up is Michael Borden, uh, who spent a decade on Capitol Hill, including serving as senior counsel uh, for the House Financial Services Committee, uh, including during the uh, last financial crisis. Uh, so he was definitely in the eye of the storm then. Uh, he's now a partner at Sidley and leads the firm's uh, government strategies group. Um, Jen Fernandez is part of Sidley's Global Arbitration Trade and Advocacy Group, and she'll be guiding us through export controls. Uh, Lee Lei uh, worked at Mofcom for eight years, and he is a partner at Sidley, leading the firm's Beijing and Shanghai offices, uh, and he will be joining us around uh, 11.30, uh, our time uh, and his time. Um, so uh, with that, let me turn to the agenda. All right. Um, so first, 
uh, John will uh, uh, give us an overview of um, what we describe as the complex web uh, of laws, executive orders that make up the US sanctions and export programs. Uh, next, Michael will discuss the new laws and pending legislation impacting Chinese companies, including the new Department of Defense uh, list. Uh, next, we'll return to John, um, who will address sanctions more specifically, drilling down uh, on the various sanction regimes and comparing primary and secondary uh, sanctions. Um, then Jen will cover uh, export controls, the various lists, how companies get on those lists and how they might be able to get off of those lists. Um, then the panel will discuss the challenges for Chinese companies and offer possible action items. Uh, Li Lei, as I mentioned, will be joining us around 11.30 and he'll be joining us for that part of the discussion. Finally, uh, the panel, um, in probably in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, uh, will take up any questions um, you know, people may have if we haven't already addressed them during the course of the, uh, of the webinar. So, you've heard enough from me. Uh, let me hand it over to John uh, to give everyone a overview. Thank you, to you, John. Thanks, Lanier. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate you attending today. Thanks to the China General Chamber of Commerce for hosting and, and again, for all of you for participating. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to give you just a brief overview of what we're going to discuss. Sanctions and export controls being the primary topic of conversation. But there is a lot of confusion between the two. And so we thought just at the start, we give you the brief separation between the two. When we talk about sanctions, it generally applies to those targeted sanctions that are imposed under the statute known as IEPA, as well as other statutes, including the very famous Hong Kong Autonomy Act that's been recently passed, as well as executive orders, regulations, and agency interpretations. The primary agency involved is the Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, as Lanier said, uh, that I headed a few years ago and worked at for more than a decade. It's a complex uh, series of regulations that OFAC can put out, so it does take a lot of understanding. And the scope of OFAC's work is generally transactions, provisions of goods and services that deal with a U.S. nexus, and that's a phrase that we'll get to in more detail. Also, we'll be talking about export controls, and that generally deals with regulations under the Export Administration Act and the Export Administration Regulations, known as the EAR. Uh, the primary agency involved there is the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, and it's all items subject to the EAR, which will be subject to uh, export controls. We're also dealing with a little bit of expansion these days with some of the Commerce Department authorities uh, under famous TikTok and WeChat uh, executive orders. So the lines are blurring a little bit. But let's move on to the next uh, slide. And we should give in the overview that every one of these rules has its own unique regulatory uh, regime. So if we talk about Iran sanctions versus China sanctions, the rules are very different. Uh, and they can change even while we're on this webinar here today. Uh, they can come out with a new statute like the Hong Kong Autonomy Act or the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, both of which have been passed in recent months executive orders, uh, including the famous ones on TikTok and WeChat, as well as regulations and guidance that any of these agencies can put out. So that's the brief overview that we wanted you to understand. And I think now I'll turn it to Michael to give you the tough job on the new laws and pending legislation. So Michael. Hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. And so what, as you know, the last four years have been a difficult period for the US-China relationship. And what began with heated rhetoric, imposition of tariffs, and, and other host, potentially hostile back and forth responses by the two countries, in the last six months in particular has really accelerated. And before I talk about what's happened in the last six months, I think it's important to flag a law that passed in 2018, the National Defense Authorization Act 
it specifically named five Chinese companies and set them apart for additional penalty. Section 889 targeted Chinese telecommunications and video surveillance companies, making it more difficult for them to sell their products directly to the US government, making it impossible to have components of their products sold to the US government, but also creating challenges for operating within the United States with other government contractors. But in the last six months, basically at the start of the pandemic, once it hit the United States, there is seem, it seems to be there has been a concerted effort, certainly by the White House, but also by members of Congress to react and respond to what's happened. Perhaps the campaign was going to be designed or focused on what China had done. President Trump seemed eager to blame China for the virus, for so our public health, for the collapse of the global economy, for unfair trade practices, for human rights violations, and then for the situation in Hong Kong. Accordingly, Congress has been very active. At the end of last year, with the, Congress passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. But more significantly, this summer, in just a matter of a couple of weeks, after the president imposed export controls on certain Chinese companies, Congress, in no mood to be outflanked or, or to be seen as weak on China, in a bipartisan, nearly unanimous effort, passed and enacted both the, Uyghur, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act and the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, as John referred. Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act requires a presentation of a periodic list and potential imposition of property blocking sanctions on entities and individuals, and also visa blocking. And the Hong Kong Autonomy Act imposes ma mandatory sanctions on foreign individuals and entities that the US believes materially contribute to the suppression of democracy in Hong Kong. And then um, also it forces financial institutions that knowingly conduct um, significant transactions to also face penalties. But Congress wasn't done yet. It's not just what's its past, it's what's still pending. And I think that these are also, I wanna highlight three potential bills for you as well. The first passed this summer, the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, which passed with, which had historically been unpopular and had no momentum. But this summer in Congress's zeal to punish China, passed the whole, the Senate unanimously passed the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act to require the delisting of, of foreign companies that the SEC and the PCAOB, the Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board, from providing complete audits of, of their financial documents. That passed the Senate unanimously, a slightly different version passed the House. And it's possible that because it's been included as an amendment in the House version of the, end of the National Defense Authorization Act, it's possible that that will pass before the end of the year. And just this week, the House of Representatives passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act and the Uyghur Forced Labor Disclosure Act in spite of opposition from the US Chamber of Commerce. But these bills would require publicly traded companies to disclose information on their supply chains, including whether or not um, products were made by forced labor. All of this brief overview is designed to show that Congress and the administration are very focused on China and are looking for ways to, de to demonstrate legislatively ways that they can act to, to respond and ways to try to change Chinese behavior, whether it ultimately can do so or not. That's just a brief overview of, of the pending legislation and the recently enacted legislation. But I now wanna to turn to a bill, a law that passed 21 years ago that no one and a provision of the law that no one had thought about in 21 years because it hadn't been used, which was section 1237 of the 1999 National Defense Authorization Act. On June 24th, the Department of Defense set a sent a letter in response to one it received last fall from Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. In its response, the Department of Defense listed 20 companies headquartered in the People's Republic of China which it determined are operating directly or indirectly in the United States and are communist Chinese military companies. This also, they expanded this list by 11 companies on August 27th. And like I said, this list was, was published pursuant to a law enacted more than 21 years ago and had never, ever, had never once been used before. 
and so if we can switch to the next slide, section 1237 authorizes the president to use IEPA, the statute that John mentioned earlier today. It, it uses IEPA to target certain entities controlled by the PLA that operate directly or indirectly in the United States. And it required the DOD to set a list. Now, it allows the IEPA to be used whether or not there's an emergency declaration in place. And the powers granted to the president are very broad. For example, and you can go to the next slide, Senator Tim Hutchinson, who was the author of the law, who is no longer in the Senate, but happens to, no, no coincidence, also happens to be from Arkansas, believed that the president under this provision would be able to take immediate action against a company named on this list, including, as he said, when the, at the time the law was passed, the ability to freeze assets or otherwise regulate these firms' activities. So far, none of that has happened. Companies have only been identified, but nothing, there have been no consequences beyond the identification so far. But now here is some more specifics. So how do you get yourself on the list? Well, you can be put on the list if you meet two, two requirements. You operate in the United States and you qualify as a Chinese communist, a communist Chinese military company as defined in the statute. As it says below, this is any person identified in a specific defense intelligence agency publication and also any other person that is owned or controlled by or affiliated with the PLA, or a ministry of the government of the PRC, or that is engaged in providing commercial services, manufacturing, producing, or exporting. In other words, it's extraordinarily broad and can be interpreted by the Department of Defense to include virtually any Chinese company. You can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, being included at this point on the DOD list has no legal effect. There certainly is some potential reputational harm but so far, no company that has been added to the DOD list has been punished or penalized because they're on the DOD list. Some of the companies have faced export controls or other restrictions as well, but it's not because of their placement yet on the DOD list. However, we believe that this is the type of list that becomes, frankly, a cheat sheet or a quick, a quick document for, for any government official, whether at the State Department, Department of Defense, USTR, the White House, the Commerce Department, to potentially the Treasury Department or OFAC to potentially impose penalties on any of these companies. Because once identified, you're now, you're now more known or better known to US government officials and government agencies. And so what are the likely risks of being included on the DOD list? We say perhaps the designation on the SDN list, which would include asset freezing, John will describe a bit of these potential direct sanctions more specifically in a moment. Um, partial sectoral sanctions, which would, which would pro prohibit certain types of transactions, right? as you've seen perhaps in the Russia context for Russian institutions, the limitations on the issuing of new debt or equity and targeting certain uh, economic sectors, and also potentially adding secondary sanctions to, to dissuade non-US individuals and entities from engaging in transactions with you as a sanctioned entity. Other potential practical impacts. You could have product exclusions similar to what we've seen in another NDAA, as I mentioned, for video surveillance or for um, video surveillance or telecommunications. Tariffs could be imposed on your goods under Section 232 or 301. There could be new challenges in obtaining CFIUS approvals or making, or making acquisitions in the United States. And finally, there could also be one of the most significant types of sanctions at all, of all, which are Magnitsky Act sanctions, which are imposed for human rights violations. So now, as we go to the next slide, which my screen, I, we're now gonna turn back to John to describe in more detail what the sanctions regimes could look like. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. So if we can move to the next slide. This is, we have two parts on the sanctions overview. We wanted to first start with just a basic reminder, refresher of what U.S. sanctions mean. So we're all on the same page with our terminology. And then we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about some of the China-focused sanctions. 
So in this first part, in the refresher, we'll just remind you that OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the Treasury, currently administers about 30 different targeted sanctions programs involving governments or regimes, individuals, entities, activities, and transactions. And as we've said before, each sanctions program has its different set of rules. So again, if you know the set of rules that deal with China, it may not be the set of rules that deal with Russia or Iran. So you'll need to make sure that you're up to date. And again, even as we're on this webinar today, the sanctions can change. Moving on. There are two general types of sanctions programs, and it's probably important that we understand each one of them. Sometimes OFAC will use terms like comprehensive. And basically what that means is for US persons, entities that have a US nexus, you can't deal at all with a handful of jurisdictions that are covered by comprehensive sanctions unless OFAC has authorized it. And there are only five of those today, and it's worth remembering those five. The Crimean region of Ukraine, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and Syria. If you're dealing at all with any of those five, you should stop a big red flag if there's a US nexus to it and say, are we sure we can do this work? Most of OFAC sanctions programs, however, are list-based meaning that they're basically OFAC's blacklist, what's known as the Specially Designated Nationals and Block Persons List, or SDN list. Those rolls, uh, OFAC rolls out updates to the SDN list, generally several times a week, as I'm sure you're familiar with, and those have two consequences. U.S. persons are required to freeze the assets of anyone on that SDN list, and U.S. persons are prohibited from doing any further business with SDNs. The Russia and the Venezuela programs fall somewhere between those two, comprehensive and list-based. Now, I said there were two types of sanctions programs. There are also two different ways of thinking about sanctions. One is primary sanctions. The other is secondary sanctions. Generally, when U.S. persons, when OFAC talks about its sanctions, it's generally dealing with primary sanctions. And that means anybody that is a U.S. person or a transaction with a U.S. nexus. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those terms. But when we're talking about those primary sanctions, if you violate, if you have a transaction that hits the U.S. financial system or the U.S. person involved, you can get a civil penalty of up to $300,000 per transaction which is why some of those major bank enforcement cases that you would have heard about can sometimes have billion dollar penalties because there could have been tens of thousands of transactions that went through the US financial system and there might have been many uh, different enforcement agencies that were involved. OFAC, the Justice Department, state prosecutors, regulators. So that's how primary sanctions can yield such massive penalties for violations. We should also emphasize that this is a strict liability standard, so it doesn't matter whether or not from the OFAC side you knew that you were violating. OFAC doesn't have to prove that you intentionally violated. OFAC has the ability to penalize you even if you did not intend a violation. It generally won't, but it does have that ability. And there are criminal penalties also that are available where intent or knowledge is demonstrated. Next slide. So secondary sanctions are what are called extraterritorial by the rest of the world. They're applicable to transaction outside the United States where there's no US person or no US nexus. And only available in a handful of sanctions programs that the US government has deemed to be of paramount importance to its national security and foreign policy. And those are the Iran program that's been known for some period of time as secondary sanctions. Russia, Syria, the cyber sanctions program, as well as more recently, the global terrorism uh, sanctions program. And this has now been threatened with Hong Kong sanctions, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the po possible penalties for non-compliance with secondary sanctions are very different. The US doesn't have jurisdiction over any company because there's no transactions 
that have hit the US financial system. So OFAC can't threaten a financial penalty, but the, the threat is even greater. The penalty could be even greater because the penalty for non-compliance with secondary sanctions is having your company's name added to the OFAC blacklist, meaning that you would be cut off from all transactions with the US financial system or the US economy or US persons. So that's even greater. Now, going back to primary sanctions, the scope is applicable to US persons and we should remind everybody who's a US person. I'm talking to you from Belgium today, but because I'm a US citizen, uh, the primary sanctions attach to me anywhere in the world as well as to any US permanent resident or green card holder anywhere in the world. Now, they also apply to any of you who might even be Chinese citizens or nationals if you happen to be in the United States. So if you're working abroad uh, dealing with something that would be prohibited for US persons and you happen to be in the US uh, at the time, then US sanctions and primary sanctions are applicable to you. They also apply to any US legal entity. So for example, Citibank, a US bank, it would apply to uh, Citibank, but it would also apply to any Citibank branch anywhere in the world. It would not apply in most circumstances to subsidiaries of US companies, but it would apply to their branches abroad. But there is an exception to that rule for Cuba and Iran is non-US subsidiaries of US parents are covered under the US person definition. And even for North Korea, financial institutions, subsidiaries abroad are also covered under the scope of US primary sanctions. The, this is probably the most important slide here for all of you to remember when it comes to the scope of US sanctions. And that's our famous US nexus because the US nexus is so broad. It can be US persons anywhere in the world, as we've talked about, US origin goods or services, but it's also the use of and transiting through the US financial system. And that's often what is, provides the most difficulty because if you're in China and you're involved in a transaction that goes from a currency in Asia to a currency in the Gulf, for example, you might think, well, why does this have anything to do with US sanctions? But the US continues to be the world's primary uh, jurisdiction for the conversion of different currency contracts. So your contract may be in US dollars, or you may need to clear uh, you, the US financial system to convert two different currencies. So you may not even see the US on the transaction, but if you're converting two different currencies, it may come through the United States. And that is how OFAC and US prosecutors and regulators often nab you to get to be a US nexus. So be very careful on what your payment chain may be. Moving on. We wanna to turn to a China focused uh, area of sanctions and you all have been reading about the, the tensions between the US and China over various issues responsible for the pandemic, the autonomy of Hong Kong, the treatment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang and elsewhere, um, the, the potential theft of trade secrets or misuse of technology, Huawei, other issues that the United States has raised with China. And we expect that you're going to continue to see various sanctions, export controls, and other actions continue, particularly as we get closer to the US presidential and congressional elections that are less than two months away. So expect to see additional actions moving forward. But no matter who is president come January, expect China to continue to be a focus of US sanctions. So the Hong Kong situation, you've read about a significant amount that escalated in May when Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo certified to Congress that uh, Hong Kong no longer enjoys a high degree of autonomy from mainland China. And that had a host of regulatory uh, ramifications that we'll talk about in the next slides. <clears throat> 
The first was Executive Order 13963. On July 4th, 2020, at the same time as the president signed into law the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, he issued Executive Order 13963, which had a host of ramifications, including suspending and eliminating certain preferential treatment for Hong Kong, but it also authorized additional sanctions with respect to Hong Kong. And you know that that occurred, I'm sure you've all followed it, because in August, on August 7th, OFAC rolled out a bunch of additional sanctions involving 11 current and former senior officials of the government of Hong Kong, including Chief Executive Carrie Lam. The most important thing to understand about those sanctions is that they're only applicable to US persons or that US nexus. So these sanctions do not apply to Chinese companies outside the United States or to non-US companies outside the US, but they do apply if you have a US nexus. But when we talk about now, the second part is the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. That also was signed into law by President Trump on July 14th. And that uh, uh, statute authorized sanctions against those that basically undermined the sovereignty of Hong Kong. You'll notice that the implications uh, of the Hong Kong Autonomy Act and where people can be added for sanctions are very similar under the HKAA, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, as they are under the executive order. But the big difference is if you were added under the HKAA, then that has the potential for those dreaded secondary sanctions. So far, no one is subject to secondary sanctions under the HKAA. The administration has not listed anyone, but there is a report that is due by the State Department by mid-October, coincidentally just a matter of weeks before the election, where the State Department would name persons that should be sanctioned under the HKAA. And if they are, then the Treasury Department has 60 days afterward to name uh, financial institutions that continue to deal with those persons that are listed on the HKAA report. No financial institution in the world wants to be uh, named on that Treasury Department report. So expect that there will be a lot of scrambling by the US government and by institutions around the world to avoid being named. Because if you are named, then within one year after the report, uh, the US government is required to institute five of possible 10 sanctions and within two years, ten, all 10 sanctions under the HKAA. And again, no financial institution wants to have that pressure of being publicly named because you can expect that the US Congress will come a call in and say, why are you continuing to do business with these entities named under the HKAA? Let's move to the next slide. Um, you also could have, um, of moving along additional sanctions uh, with respect to what are considered by the US government to be human rights abuses. So there is uh, a statute that was, was passed a couple months ago called the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act that basically authorizes sanctions on Chinese officials and others for human rights abuses in the Xinjiang region of China. But the US government hasn't utilized that statute. Instead, they've been utilizing other authorities. So for example, on July 1st, the US government, a number of US government agencies issued a, a supply chain advisory that basically warned of the legal risk and reputational risks of companies doing business uh, in Xinjiang, which could have legal ramifications into the, in the United States. And on July 9th, and then again on July 31st, OFAC issued sanctions on prominent entities and individuals in Xinjiang and operating in that region under what's known as the Global Magnitsky Act. So not under this Uyghur Human Rights Act, but under the Global Magnitsky Act, and most notably the XPCC, which is uh, basically operating throughout that region, 
Uh, and OFAC also issued a general license that said, if you're dealing with XPC subsidiaries, we're gonna give you some time to wind that down. And that time goes on until September 30th. So this is something that is, is very much the focus of US government attention. There's also a Holding Foreign Count Companies Accountable Act, which Michael has already mentioned. It would have a number of ramifications. It's been passed by the Senate. It's under review by the House. One thing that's very important to note about the, this area is that the administration, regardless of this statute, the administration is looking to do much of what is, would be called on by this statute, uh, by its own uh, a, a, administrative agencies. The White House has tasked the Securities and Exchange Commission and others with looking at some of these same uh, restrictions and you may see some of these uh, ramifications and implications in the future, no matter what happens. Moving forward. The last area that I'll cover on the sanctions update is the South China Sea and East China Sea Sanctions Act. It was introduced in the se uh, Senate. It's still awaiting consideration in uh, the both houses of Congress, but it doesn't matter what Congress does. We're trying to give you an update on what you should be knowing uh, going into the future. And statements, public statements by the members of the administration, including Secretary of State Pompeo, have hinted that there may be sanctions forthcoming on actors that are operating in the South China Sea in land reclamation, island making, uh, making uh, lighthouse construction, and some of the other activities that the US government has considered. So if you're involved in any of those types of activities, I would say that you're engaged in a, what's known as a more high risk activity. We'll talk about risk assessments moving forward, but this is something we wanted to alert you to. So moving forward, uh, we're moving to our next topic. I'm turning over to Jen. We have plenty of time that we're gonna talk about sanctions moving forward, but we've got a lot to cover in today's uh, webinar. So thank you, and Jen, over to you. Thanks, John. So switching from sanctions to export controls, um, there is a lot of overlap uh, between sanctions and export controls, and a lot of people will lump them together. But there are some key differences that I wanted to highlight as we dive into export controls. As you heard from John, um, sanctions can be used as a foreign policy tool to punish parties or to punish governments or to try to force a change in their behavior. Whereas export controls tend to focus more on safeguarding technology so that it is not used against the United States. Sanctions applies to the activities of all U.S. persons and, and transactions with a U.S. nexus to a specific product, um, at, no matter where it is in the world. Uh, sanctions have broad prohibitions, generally prohibiting all dealings with sanctioned parties, whereas export controls are more targeted restrictions and are not generally prohibitions. They're more license requirements where the government just wants to know what you're doing and to have a chance to review it before you do it. So, and on licenses, OFAC generally does not uh, issue a lot of licenses to, uh, to parties that wanna engage in, in activities that are otherwise prohibited by sanctions, whereas export controls uh, issue licenses all the time. The, the BIS issues, issues uh, licenses as a matter of course and tries to promote business and, and trade whenever possible. All that said, uh, this administration, the Trump administration, has really adopted export controls as a lighter form of sanctions in many cases, particularly to punish the Chinese government and Chinese companies. So just as John gave you an overview of, of uh, sanctions before diving into the more specifics and recent actions, I also wanted to give you a quick refresher on what are export controls. At a very high level, these are essentially license requirements based on the sensitivity of an item and its destination. What an item is, is, is very broad. It is physical goods, it is software, it is technology, which could be technical data or technical assistance. And the export of this isn't just putting it into a box and shipping it with DHL. It also is uh, telephone conversations and, and access to servers or emails. So um, the, the restrictions can be fairly broad. Next slide, please. There are two principal export control regimes. Uh, I wanted to mention the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, which controls defense items and is administered by the State Department. There is currently a U.S. arms embargo uh, on China 
And so no ITAR controlled items can go to China. So when we talk about export controls, what we're really discussing here are the export administration regulations, which are administered by the Department of Commerce and control so-called dual use items. And dual use means that there could be a military uh, advantage or application, but they're generally considered to be commercial items. The way export controls work is there, oh, could you go back? Thank you. Uh, is there is the commerce control list, which lists all of these items, which could include uh, armored vehicles, chemicals, biotech equipment, semiconductors, software, aerospace items, but anything that is not listed on the commerce control list does not automatically fall out of U.S. jurisdiction. So, for example, this pencil here is technically subject to uh, the EAR. It is what is considered EAR 99, which is a catch-all category for anything that's not specifically listed um, on the commerce control list. And what is subject to the EAR? Any item that's currently located in the U.S. So think if you have foreign software that you upload to a U.S. server, that foreign software becomes subject to U.S. export controls. Anything that's made in the United States, no matter how many times it is exported and re-exported around the world. And then there are some extraterritorial applications for foreign made items that include a certain amount of U.S. Um, controlled content. So to China, anything with more than 25% of U.S. controlled content makes that foreign product subject to U.S. export controls or products that are made directly from U.S. software or technology that is sensitive, uh, even if made outside the United States, would be subject to uh, U.S. jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So just because an item is subject to the EAR does not mean it requires a license just because it is listed on the commerce control list does not mean that it requires a license. And conversely, because it is EAR 99, like the pencil example, does not mean that it does not require a license. So what you really need to know is what is the item that will be exported? Where is it going? Who will receive it? And what will the end use be? So with an armored vehicle, you can imagine that as a sensitive item, it will require a license to most destinations whereas the pencil will not require a license to most destinations unless it's going to a U.S. embargoed country, such as Syria, if it's going to an OFAC sanctioned party or a Commerce Department restricted party, uh, or it could be used, for example, in a prohibited um, end use like weapons of mass destruction. Next slide, please. So what we really wanna talk about today is the Department of Commerce restricted party list and mainly the entity list, but before we get into the entity list, the Department of Commerce actually has a number of restricted party lists. One of them is the denied persons list, which at a high level includes certain violators of the EAR, and that could be U.S. or non-U.S. companies. They also have the unverified list, which is um, parties of concern. There isn't a prohibition against exports to the unverified list parties, but it does trigger additional uh, diligence obligations on the exporter, certain and user checks and the like. Um, but the one that has received the most attention and has received the most activity recently is the entity list, which is essentially, despite the name entity list, a list of organizations, institutions, companies, individuals, and other parties that the U.S. has determined that they have or pose a risk of acting contrary to U.S. national security or foreign policy. As you can imagine, that is a very broad um, category of activities. But I, I want to emphasize how broad that can be. There's absolutely no need to violate the EAR to become subject to the entity list restrictions. There is no need to actually have engaged in the uh, activities contrary to US national security or foreign policy. And even if you have engaged in such activities, there's no need to have used US goods in that activity. And there's no need for definitive proof that you have engaged or will engage in such activities. The standard here for the end user uh, review committee, which is the multi-agency committee that designates parties to the entity list, uh, is a reasonable belief based on specific facts. So this entity list uh, is traditionally been used uh, to address U.S. concerns of diversion of U.S. goods to Iran or the Chinese military or to other prohibited end items. However, it's been expanded in recent uh, years, particularly with respect to Chinese companies. So what happens when you're on the entity list? You cannot purchase or receive any item subject to the EAR. And that includes, like my EAR 99 example, the pencil. I could not send this pencil to anyone on the entity list. 
So all items in the U.S., uh, all items of U.S. origin, and even those certain foreign-made items. But there are limits to the restrictions of the entity list. Um, it only applies to the specifically designated party, unlike the OFAC list uh, that will sweep in the subsidiaries of uh, sanctioned parties. This is only the specific, uh, I'm sorry, I just found out that my video feed went off and let me just make sure that I turn it back on. Apologies for the inconvenience. There you are. I hope yep. you all can see me now. Thank You're you. Back, yeah. So I apologize. <laughs> Excellent. So I was discussing the uh, the limits to the restrictions. So um, yes, it only applies to the designated entities. It doesn't apply to services, only the specific goods uh, subject to the EAR. So U.S. persons could still provide services to an entity list entity. It doesn't apply to items that are not subject to the EAR. How should I know? You have a phone. Now, Jen, I think we have unfortunately lost audio. Um, I hear someone talking. Is it now, Jen? It's connected to my from an entity list entity. There we go. So I have a comment here that um, that some people can't hear me. I just want to make sure that that my audio is coming through for for most. Um, you're you're coming in and out, um, Jen. This is Lania. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. So then it's you're clear one second, and then there was it was coming in and out. So why don't you try again? And and if we can't hear you, we can always skip ahead and come back to you once we figure out the technical difficulties. Sure. How am I coming through right now? Crystal Good clear. for right now. Crystal clear. Excellent. Okay, so um, the Trump administration has used the entity list uh, very frequently to target Chinese entities. Uh, there are approximately 1,500 or so entities on the entity list right now, and 300 of those are located in China. And that does not include all of the affiliates of those Chinese companies that are listed under a different country. In 2019, the US government placed over 150 Chinese companies and their affiliates on the entity list. And as you can see from this timeline, uh, 2020 has also been very active. In addition to those traditional diversion of US goods uh, concerns, Chinese entities have been added for human rights concerns in Xinjiang and also for uh, activities in the um, South China Sea. We expect this also to continue and, and we'll see some more Chinese designations uh, in the coming months. So we've received a lot of interest in this topic. If you're on the list, how do you get off the list? There are essentially three ways to do that. Um, you can petition to be removed. The end user review committee annually reviews all of their uh, entries to see if any modifications or removals are warranted, or a specific member agency of the ERC can issue uh, a request for the ERC to consider. Uh, to be removed, the ERC would need to believe that the entity is no longer engaged in and is unlikely to engage in the future uh, in the conduct that put them on the list in the, in the first place. And the ERC needs to determine that that is the case unanimously, whereas a company goes on the list by majority vote, it only comes off or is modified by unanimous vote. And this is a really difficult standard. Um, there have been fewer than 200 removals since the beginning of this uh, list in 1997. Uh, for those 200, they were on the list for an average of two to three years. And one of the obstacles that many companies face is that it's not always entirely clear why they've been placed on the list. There's a very broad description of the reasons, but a lot of the sources are considered classified or the, the department doesn't want to be particularly transparent. So this is how the, um, the request to get off uh, works. You, a party can submit a request. The ERC chair, which is the Department of Commerce, circulates the request to the member agencies. Then the ERC uh, is required to vote on that request within 30 days of the circulation. If, um, as I said, it has to be a unanimous vote. If one of the agencies disagrees with the decision, they can appeal it through their internal system all the way up to 
the uh, secretaries of the various uh, agencies and then ultimately up to the president. However, if no agency appeals, the ERC chair, again, Commerce, prepares the response and BIS, one of the agencies at Commerce, notifies the parties. Um, if there's no change, the process ends there. If there is a change, it gets published in the Federal Register, which is the same publication that originally listed the party as uh, subject to the entity list restriction. But what's really important here is that um, only the agencies can internally escalate this. A party cannot uh, appeal this, either internally within the agency or in a court. And so this really is a key area where you want to make sure that you have um, a lobbyist or other outreach where you can really explain your position to the various uh, agencies individually to try to get one of these agencies on your side so that if there is uh, a deadlock, they can, they can escalate it up the chain themselves. So this is my final slide and I won't spend a lot of time here. I know we were really um, focused on the, the various lists that parties can end up on. But I wanted to highlight that in the last five months or so, there have been uh, a number of export related actions that have uh, impacted Chinese companies specifically. And so you can follow this timeline and see how, um, how the administration has been escalating and using export controls specifically against Chinese companies. And there will be more to come. There are a number that are in the pipeline uh, that are being considered right now. So it is very, very important to continue to monitor these because under this administration in particular, a lot of these rules come out as final and effective almost immediately. And so you really need to stay on top of these to make sure you're not in violation of export control laws. Thank you. That's a nice segue. Back to Michael. Thank you, Jen. Um, that's a nice segue. Thank you very much. So yeah, if we chat and turn to challenges for Chinese companies and for possible action plans, and if we could go to the next slide. Um, which was uh, where uh, Jen left off. So maybe I, it was, uh, John or Michael, do you uh, just maybe handle the first one of these, the monitor developments and how, uh, how companies can go about doing that? Sure. So we've presented so far a, a pretty bleak picture. We've described a situation that's very challenging and outlined a series of rules and potential penalties and how they can be imposed that can sound really daunting. And I think that a lot of you might now be asking yourselves, well, what's the point? If they're just going to come after us anyway, whether we're a, a large Chinese company, an SOE, whatever that may be, why would we, ever, what, what's the point of even trying to engage with the US government? Is there any chance for a positive outcome? And I think what we wanna do now over the next, just over the next few bullets is provide you an overview and explain actually that Though the, cha though the challenges are great and they're very real, we think that constructive engagement is perhaps the best chance you have of having and achieving a positive outcome. One of these elements here, and this is the first, and all of us on this panel are going to participate on this slide, is an element here is monitoring developments. And it sounds but it's also very difficult. There are a lot of different challenges coming from a U.S. government that's big, bureaucratic, with ag different agencies making different announcements. And you can ask, well, how do we as a company continue or manage to follow all of this? What can we know? And this is something I think that over what we're going to start describing over the next few bullets here is really important. It's important to stay on top of developments in the United States, whether it, and generally I would argue it's with your outside law firms who can help you keep on top of the issues so that you as a legal department can manage the legal risks as executive decision makers can understand and manage so you can plan for potential outcomes and potential uncertainties. And the more familiar you are with US rules and policies, will allow you to better understand what you can or what you need to do to help manage some of these risks. And that I think gets to the next piece, which John's going to describe, which is the risk assessment that you can- My, Yeah, before we get there, uh, Michael, we just, we got a uh, question in um, uh, about uh, the White House in particular. Um, and somebody says, uh, there seems to be no good channel to track the discussions and the progress in the White House with respect to sanctions. Uh, how can you go about doing that? And, and I think we all appreciate how um, fickle uh, the current administration can be at times. Um, 
And so how do you, what's the best way to monitor these things? How, how does one do it both in terms of the White House, Treasury, Congress? It's, very, it's a real challenge um, because the reality is, so something that I, I should have mentioned at the outset, back in July, when I was providing an overview about what's happened and what's coming, I was told in mid to late July by a Trump administration official and also a Trump campaign official that we should expect punitive announcements or an announcement from the administration every three to four days about punitive actions that would be taken against the Chinese government, Chinese companies or Chinese individuals every three to four days from that day until at least election day, which is November 3rd. And it's proven to be like clockwork. Every three or four days, there is a new significant announcement that comes from the White House. And it's, you, it's very hard to anticipate. People aren't sharing this information publicly. But this is also part of the engagement process. You can, through out, with the outside assistance, develop relationships and conversations with policymakers at the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, the White House, the Vice President's Office, the Treasury Department, Congress, that can help you perhaps anticipate, but never true, you're never truly going to know, I think. I think that expectation line here is almost, it's almost impossible to, to be able to expect that you're going to know in advance that a sanction would be imposed, how our specific sanctions would be imposed. But by engaging and being involved in the developments and really following what's happening, I think that you can plan and understand what the possible, what possible things could happen. All right, now that, that's and a, to prevent it and to put yourself yeah. and the key is knowing that it's possible is to put yourself in a position to in your in the best position to try to be is to try to not be included on this. And one of those is, I think, the risk assessment that John's going to describe. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Lenny. Or I think I'm going to follow up on that first point too on the monitor of the developments and just say, I think uh, seminars, webinars like this one are helpful. And I spend a lot of my time on webinars like this one and other industry groupings, because you always find out something that someone else, some nugget that someone else has. I also think that we all get a lot of spam in our email inboxes every day, but I've signed up to every one of the US government agencies that have anything to do with restrictions so that they're pumped into my off uh, email inbox as soon as they come along. And it helps if you see a Commerce Department restriction in one area that focuses on, on, for example, Xinjiang or human rights abuses, then you can say, well, what's Treasury going to do on this? Maybe we need to start worrying on that area as well. well now, let, me ask, on let me ask you a question on that, uh, on sure. that point. Um, um, is there any downside to registering? I could see maybe a company, a Chinese company said, well, look, if I sign up for OFAC, um, you know, um, alerts or uh, uh, am I putting my radar screen? I don't, I don't think so. I think that one, I think that that implies a lot more tracking ability than I think the US that OFAC would do. But I think uh, OFAC expects in part of uh, OFAC's enforcement view will be, did you conduct reasonable due diligence? Were you reasonably aware of the work that you're doing? And if you're not even getting OFAC sanctions alerts and you're supposed to be complying with US sanctions, then I think that that would be held against you rather than something that would, could be actually a negative. But conducting risk assessments is the second one that we've recommended here. And I'm gonna give a little bit of backstory to this. Just over a year ago, OFAC put out a document called a Framework for Compliance Commitments. If any of you have not reviewed that document, then you should Google OFAC Compliance Commitments and review the document that comes out that the Treasury Department put out. And basically, OFAC recommended that every global company do five things. Uh, the first was making sure that you have a management commitment to compliance, but the second was conduct risk assessments. And what they mean by that is that you should have a good understanding of the overall risk of your organization. What types of products and services do you offer? And in what geographies are you involved with? 
So for example, if you're a global company that's doing business, for example, outside the United States with Iran, then you should accept that you have a relatively high risk when it comes to a potential violation of US sanctions, because Iran is, remember, one of those five jurisdictions subject to comprehensive sanctions. And OFAC would also say, as you're going into new business lines, engaging in new areas of business around the world, then you should also do a risk assessment with respect to those particular business lines. Does the business line give you enhanced exposure to sanctions risk? Let me give you an example. If these days you are doing engaging in a new business line that would deal with technology involving China and potentially the United States, then I would say with all of the export controls and sanctions rules that have been coming out in recent months, that gives you a more high risk industry sector it doesn't mean you don't do the business, but what it does mean is that you have to very carefully analyze your risk and make sure that you have the appropriate internal controls and policies and procedures to be able to manage that. And that may be my good segue to turn to Jen to talking about developing appropriate compliance policies and procedures. Jen, that was for you. Uh, Jen, you may be still on mute. Can you take yourself off mute? Hmm. I see your phone is still muted, so I don't know if you're going through the phone or you're going through the uh, computer audio. All right, well, maybe what we'll do while we figure out these technical, or we'll try and sort out these technical difficulties is uh, move on. Uh, or if somebody can talk about uh, compliance procedures and uh, policies and procedures, maybe um, Michael, is that something you could uh, pick up? Yeah, I mean, just at a high level, this, all of these pieces to avoid additional penalties is to be able to show that you're doing your best and you're, you've taken best efforts to comply with US regulations and laws. And if you have a specific regime in place, and if you have a comprehensive plan, um, it, 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 again, it's, it's another signal, and it's an important signal to a US, to the, a US government decision maker that you're operating as a respected and respectable global company with sophisticated operations, uh, controls, uh, and, and risk management procedures in place. If you have these formal procedures and you've actually worked through them, it makes you more likely than not to be um, to avoid compliance mistakes that you know, avoid the traps that the US government has set and makes it more likely that you'll avoid problems that would eventually um, earn the ire of the US government. It looks like Jen, as I see her phone no longer has the, uh, the mute sign on. So perhaps she's, Jen wants to add some thoughts. This is really not my day for technology. So thank you for your patience. But uh, just building on what, what Michael said, um, you know, if you, have good compliance policies and procedures and you understand the rules, you can avoid, you, you can't avoid all risks, uh, but you can avoid some of the risks uh, of designation that would relate to uh, mishandling or violations of the EAR. And one of the ways that you can demonstrate or make your case to get off the entity list is really showing that you have a commitment to compliance and have taken really good demonstrated steps towards that compliance. And that's where the, these compliance policies and procedures come in. On the uh, on that talking of the um, OFAC guidance, perhaps um, uh, April and others at the uh, chamber, we can add the OFAC issue, uh, you know, framework for compliance to the Legal Resource Center because I do I, I agree with John. It is a um, it's a, you know relatively short document and a critical read for all those that are working in this space. We will do that. All right, great. Um, so let's turn to um, outreach and education, um, and um, um, maybe John will get your thoughts on, um, and then turn to Michael, who spent uh, a number of years on the Hill. You know, I'll press you both on this. Is it worth it? Um, are they really going to engage with Chinese companies, particularly in an election year? Uh, when you look at the Pew Research, it shows that 
you know, 66% of um, Americans, or at least those who were polled, have a, some negative view of China. Um, and, um, you know, are, are they going to get any traction? Whether well, uh, it's in you Washington have... or with the press or the media. So I'll hand it over to you guys. So Lenny, since you, you reference me, I'll just say that from the OFAC perspective, people are always frustrated. I can't get a meeting at OFAC. And I'll explain why. I spent 11 years there, uh, the last several years as its director, and it seemed like every company in the world wanted to come in and talk to this relatively small agency about the issues of the day. And what I would recommend that if you have issues, it's more important, and I think it would be more persuasive to be able to come in as an industry group to raise those issues with OFAC and explain the ramifications. And you, when you ask, will they care what Chinese companies think? I will tell you what the US government cares about is impact on the US and the global economy. So when you come in to OFAC or US government agencies, it's probably not helpful to say, I'm a Chinese company, these sanctions will harm me as a Chinese company. But I do think what's more important to be able to come in and say is that we've analyzed this type of sanction or what we fear may be future sanctions and you should understand the ramifications to US companies to non-US companies, to the global economy, and here are some things we'd like you to do. And not just so much don't do the sanctions, but for example, um, a good example, the, the US government put sanctions on the XPCC, as I mentioned in Xinjiang, but they also went out with the general license that allowed uh, wind down continued transactions. So those are the kind of things that OFAC learns from industry. So if industry comes in and says, this would be this type of sanction would be very difficult to implement very near impossible and this is what we would need ofac would take that into consideration but michael might have more to say on the lobbying side and approaching the hill well, let me just and then we'll turn over to michael one one question for you on on that point uh there's a saying in in china that um to be famous is like a pig getting fat um and it's similar to the question I asked before. So let's say a CGCC, for example, wants to go speak to uh, OFAC uh, and say the Hong Kong Autonomy Act is problematic or something along those lines. Um, does that bring more trouble uh, to the organizations? Um, does it put them on the radar screen of the regulators? Are there downsides to going in and saying something? I think the answer is no from my perspective. When you go in as the CGCC, I think individual companies might be more reluctant to be identified and I could understand the reason. But if you go in as an industry group and you can provide uh, details from the industry perspective, then it can be helpful to pass along some of those concerns. Now, there's a downside, I guess, in the sense that OFAC could analyze ahead of time and decide that the concern is not relevant. But if you want to be heard by the US government, the best way I think to be heard is by going in is industry associations. And I will tell you from long experience at OFAC, the most persuasive comments that I heard during my entire time there came from industry groups in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia with respect to the broad implications of US sanctions and how they could have broad impacts on a variety of industries, companies in an industry sector. Right, that's very helpful, very helpful. Michael, over to you, what are your thoughts? So I'm gonna disagree a little bit. And in part, the reason I'm going to disagree is I'm gonna use just the example of the last 45 days in the WeChat executive order. So as I'm sure everyone on this call was you know, very aware and you know, followed very closely the announcement in early August by the White House of a potential ban in 45 days of the use of WeChat. And it could have been interpreted and explained broadly, and it could have been ultimately, I mean, crushing to businesses, many businesses that operate both, that operate globally, 
if they would have been prevented from using WeChat. It would have been completely disruptive to their operations, potentially to their businesses and bottom line. And it was possible that the executive order could have been as broad as to punish companies in the United companies that were operating exclusively within China, selling goods to Chinese consumers um, with their who were buying them on their apps to a Chinese college student in the United States who was just using WeChat to potentially talk back and forth with his family back in Beijing. So the rule could have been incredibly broad, but over a 45 day period, the Commerce Department heard from, including we represented a number of these companies, individual companies who explained their story and the particular impact on them, their business, and, and tried to show that the rules, though designed to protect US national security, individual, US individual data privacy and um, and data integrity, that if the rules were broadly applied, the, the US government wasn't going to achieve its goals. And so what we did instead over the course of those 45 days is present the case to the decision makers at the Commerce Department who seemed to truly listen, which really gets to this sort of the ultimate questions. Is it worth engaging? Will they ever listen to us? There's an, there's an election where China seems to be one of the main issues. Is there any reason for us to try to, if the, when the US government seems to want to punish us in every way possible, is there ever any way out? And the answer is yeah. Yeah, because after 45 days, last week, the Commerce Department announced a relatively narrow uh, WeChat executive order implementation that was really pretty limited to the use of WeChat in the United States, something that Chinese companies and American companies that do business in China and with Chinese companies could probably pretty well manage. And so I think it was a really, it's a really important element of engagement. And I think it's really important to try as yourself um, to explain what a rule could mean to you and to your business. But as part of that, and as part of that, and what we include here in our description in number four of outreach and education, I wanna sort of take a step back and make this a bit more general is that a Chinese company, frankly, any company, can't take for granted that US policymakers fully or deeply understand its position. And at the outset of any engagement, I think it's really important that you know, a company introduces itself because as administration and congressional policymakers grapple with large ge geopolitical issues and search for ways to resolve them, in a manner that promotes American priorities, I think it's very helpful and important to maintain a significant, to maintain a significant but low key and often behind the scenes presence. Because if you can, as a company, can lay out the basics, confront the challenges directly, you're well positioned or you're better positioned to limit any future punitive actions by the US government and also to build a path toward freeing yourself from such actions. So consistent and effective interactions, education and advocacy can help a company take full advantage of administrative and legislative developments. And it's my view that direct engagement in conversations with key administration officials, legislators, and senior staffers can have a really substantial positive effect on the course of events. And working with um, outside law firms, they can help facilitate those conversations. Some of us can help facilitate those types of conversations for you. Well, let's, and, let's turn, you know, if I can, Mike, let's just turn sure. one second back to the, the WeChat TikTok example, because I think that's a good one, right? Um, um, John says industry groups the way to go. And certainly if you're dealing with OFAC, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you say with respect to this executive order or these executive orders, it was, um, you know, direct engagement by companies and others. Um, what do you think it was with TikTok and WeChat? What do you think was the effective, the, the messaging that worked with the administration? So I think it was really important that the companies that engaged were pretty sophisticated at framing the debate. And this is something that we recommend really before engagement with any client. And if you're ever going to go to the administration or to Congress, you really have to think about this, is 
the message that you deliver to policymakers and stakeholders has to be carefully constructed and communicated in ways that appeal to their interests. And so I think that we were able, on behalf of some of our clients, to have that type of a positive impact because we were able to show that a broad implementation of the executive order could be chaotic. It could cause significant harm to U.S employment, um, U.S. businesses, and the, you know, one of what is President Trump's key concerns is the tracking of the Dow. We showed that you could still achieve your goal. You got the headline, you showed that you were being tough on China, but with tailored and targeted rulemaking, you could still say that you had made Americans safer, you had protected individual data, you made U.S. nationals, you prioritized U.S. national security, while still allowing legitimate transactions to occur. And I think that we were able to show for a number of clients specific and significant examples that allowed the Commerce Department to understand that to go too far would have hurt the United States just as much as it would have hurt China or more. And there was really no need. There was, um, there was no need to go that far. And so I think that that was a really key, that was, the, that was I think, what allowed us to be successful in this endeavor. That makes sense. And, and back to, I mean, uh, John, back to you for a second. Uh, um, I, I want to make sure you, your, your voice was, was, is clear that, you know, when it comes to OFAC, industry engagement is good, but, you know, you could certainly see instances where um, specific companies may, may be able to come forward. So let me just hand it back to you, John, to make sure. Absolutely. I, I agree with Michael's points. I don't disagree with his comments. I think I was responding to your question about do you see a disadvantage for individual companies coming in. OFAC often heard, and I think the Commerce Department often heard from individual companies, those would be transmitted throughout the government, and those comments were heard. So I fully support the idea of individual companies coming in to be able to talk to, about implications on the companies, and that can be uh, make a difference. Uh, but if you have any concern as an individual company, or if you want to multiply or echo your voice, then coming in as industries can also be very helpful. So I'm saying engage. Whether you do it as a company, whether you do it as an industry, engage with the US government. Um, if you don't, then you may not like the consequences. Okay, yeah, that's a fair, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's fair. Now we got um, another question, which is a good one. And that is, um, you know, it's difficult to have a meeting with Treasury. Um, it's not like you pick up the phone and call them and they say, come on in. Um, it's, you know, you mentioned it's difficult to get into OFAC. Obviously, it's a relatively small department. They have an awful lot on their plate. Um, so how, how does one go about securing meetings, either with Treasury, uh, with one of its agencies, um, OFAC? I assume FinCEN probably never has any meetings, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, with, you know, uh, Secretary Ross at, at Commerce, how, does, how, do, how practically speaking, how does a company go about doing that? From the OFAC side, I'll tell you that if you request a meeting, OFAC's going to say, put it in writing why we need a meeting. So they're going to say, explain the background, explain the circumstances, and then tell us what you need in a meeting that we can't get from a writing. Because again, OFAC may hear from thousands of companies over the course of a year, and OFAC wants to actually see the written documentation for what you're saying. So a meeting, people often will come in and try to say something that they could have put in writing. So if you can put it in writing and explain what else you want to say uh, in a meeting, that will be helpful. So sometimes it's being able to get to the particulars of a country, company's situation and be able to answer questions from OFAC. Maybe it's sometimes putting in an industry submission and saying, and we'll offer to bring in all of our industry members so we can answer the question. Those are good areas where you can get meetings from the OFAC side. And what, uh, Michael, what about on the, you know, if you're a, a, um, on the house side, for example, the uh, um, Financial Services Committee, um, how, how, how would you recommend approaching them? Yeah, so Leonard, I think that one of the dirty secrets of Washington is that access is really, really hard. As often it's not. 
it's the, the hardest part about a meeting is what you're going to say in the meeting and the substance of the meeting, just as John described. You know, everybody, whether you're a House staffer, you're a member of Congress, you're a, you're a secretary of an agency, you're busy. You talk to people all day long. And so the key is once you get into the meeting, the, the message you say is compelling and difficult. I think that often for a Chinese company to try to meet with a member of Congress, the best thing is to try to identify a nexus to that member's office, to that, dis that congressional district. You have operations outside of Seattle. You know, you talk to, you first look to talk, talk to the members of Congress who represent that area, who would have an interest in what, in what your work is there. Or if you're in, you know, you're a, a Chinese bank, um, you, you turn your attention to the financial, the House Financial Services Committee or the Senate Banking Committee. Institutions sort of that are set up to actually, with professional staff, to understand and hear your issues and to understand beyond just a political reason, um, the substance and sort of the benefit of speaking with you. I think that you'll find that many US policymakers are actually very eager to hear your story because most don't have, particularly in Congress, members of Congress get their information from public sources and from talking to people. And so generally I argue to potential clients, to clients and friends, whomever, that engagement, I think that this is similar to what John said a few minutes ago, it, you know, it is better to engage. It is better to have conversations. It's better to share your story because they're going to get their information somehow, and it may as well be from you. And the idea that sort of you can hide and you know, hide and pray that they're certainly, they're gonna miss you or they're not going to find you, that's a strategy, but it's not usually a good one. It's far more likely that you're going to have a better outcome. And certainly it's no guarantee. And certainly it's not a guarantee in this environment, but you have a much better chance of a better outcome if you engage before you have a problem, before you've actually identified something, an action that's been taken against you. So you can start to develop relationships. You can be seen as a credible and trusted source of information. You will work with them. And I think that's really important is to, and then to maintain that presence, to be consistent about it be consistent and have you know, behind the scenes conversations. To be a trusted, so a trusted source of information is really valuable. Let me uh, turn, we have uh, Lile uh, on the um, line uh, from joining us from Beijing. Um, hopefully you can, he can hear us. Uh, a, a question to him um, is from, from what you have heard and seen, what has, Chinese companies most concerned, and I understand it's a broad generalization, but at least of what you heard from Chinese companies, what are they most concerned about when it comes to either sanctions, export controls, um, or anything related to those subjects? All right, well, maybe it is 1230 in Beijing, so maybe uh, uh, Lile, I see you still on there, but okay. So uh, Lile, if you, if you can't hear us um, or you can, um, you know, pipe in whenever you, uh, whenever you have a moment. So um, let me touch upon another question that we've been asked and it relates to uh, uh, the thicket that is FARA, um, and, uh, which is the Foreign Agent Registration Act. And somebody asked, you know, um, about FARA and the risks of violations. So we're talking about lobbying and outreach, um, and we could do a whole seminar on FARA. Um, uh, but the statute has been read pretty broadly. Um, and um, even though, you know, it started off in the 1940s to deal with, you know, potential na Nazi sympathizers, uh, it has expanded, at least its interpretation has expanded by then. It, briefly, um, how can you avoid tripping it if you want to either write, even if you write an article, an op-ed in, uh, in the uh, newspaper, lobbying, how best to avoid tripping FARA? Maybe Michael and then John. Yeah, so FARA is a, a compliance headache, but there are a number of exemptions and exceptions to the FARA requirements. Um, 
often, many of them often involve provide the provision of legal services, but it doesn't include the publicity, um, writing op-eds, like you said. But one of the key exemptions to FARA is if you register under the Lobby Disclosure Act. And the Lobby Disclosure Act is, while it requires pu it's a public disclosure, it's much less onerous. And in a consequence, it's much easier to comply with and it's much simpler. So I may, it, it's in most instances, or in many instances, I want to say most, um, if you're engaged in public advocacy for a foreign company, it is possible to do that through the LDA instead of through FARA. But it's not always possible. And it's, off, it's less possible in situations where state ownership is involved because then FARA is also required. But it, it's a case-by-case -case situation. And so, Lanyard, it would be, it's a situation where depending on the individual company's circumstances is a way you can discuss FARA compliance. But there are exemptions and exclusions, but all of it is designed. There's no way of avoiding, you know, of truly being anonymous. But there are these, because these are truly designed to the, so that the U.S. government can know who's speaking and why. Right. And the so LDA you, is far less, the requirements of LDA are far, far easier to comply with. Far less onerous. By right. leaps, bounds, miles, yards, it's, okay. LDA is wonderful compared to FARA. All right, and John, what do you think? Would you, do you agree or what, what's your thoughts on that? And I, I'll have my expertise on sanctions and We've, uh, um, the sound is coming in and out a little bit, but okay. Um, we've, we've pushed our luck with the technology. <laughs> we did <laughs> well. Okay, we can hear you now, John. Okay, fair enough. Um, let me, uh, John, can, if you can hear me, let me, uh, we've got two minutes left. Um, and uh, from a purely uh, selfish point of view, let me ask a couple of questions about OFAC. Is, your position you had as director, is that a political appointee position or is it a permanent position? It's a career civil servant position. So that it is, it, you maintain that throughout a, a different changes of administration. All of OFAC are career civil servants. I see, and, and you mentioned it's relatively small. How, how many, just so people get an understanding, how many, uh, any idea how many people work or work there when you were there? It's probably about 250 right now, 250 to 300, which sounds large when you're another uh, country sanctions agency and minuscule when it comes to the U.S. government. Uh, as, as OFAC says, it punches above its weight. <laughs> it certainly does. Uh, the, it's got a, it's a, obviously a big name worldwide. Uh, uh, so, um, and how best to, if you have a question about a sanction regime, because I think we've all looked at them over the years and they're not necessarily the most easiest things to implement. Can people get guidance from OFAC? And if so, how best to do that? You can get guidance from OFAC. OFAC is gonna expect you, OFAC probably puts out more FAQs than any government agency. They put out a ton. They expect you to do your homework. But if you have a question beyond what OFAC has asked, you can, or put out it uh, publicly, you can use, OFAC's compliance hotline. That's either, either a telephone hotline or an internet hotline. And OFAC is actually pretty good about getting 48 hours if it is a basic question. If you have a more substantial question about can you do something that would otherwise violate US sanctions, you have to go to OFAC's licensing division and that can take far longer. That's very helpful. Um, well, it, we are up to 12.30, um, and so um, I think we should need to leave it there. Um, of course, we will circulate um, uh, the slides, and so you have all of our contact information. We, all of us would be happy to address any specific questions you may have um, uh, afterwards. I want to thank um, the CGCC for putting this on. I want to thank the panelists for a fascinating discussion. Um, I, from again, from a purely selfish point of view, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you to all of them. Um, and uh, look for more quality content uh, from the CGCC. And 
uh, we look forward to uh, all speaking uh, with you and, and hopefully one day meeting in person when this is uh, behind us. So thank you. Have a good rest of the day and we appreciate your time.